I think I was an engineer and a scientist from day one. Uh, <laughs> I was very surprised and um, overwhelmed, terrified, happy, thrilled, bouncing off the walls. I was in a hotel room so I could bounce off the walls and nobody would see me. <laughs> I was walking around in circles because I wasn't allowed to call home. And then after I called home, I, could, I was walking around in circles because no one answered the telephone. <laughs> It was a pretty thrilling moment. Then I really had to take a shower because I knew it would be a very long day. It's a bit of a funny story. My first phone call was to my son, James. Uh, and of course, he didn't answer the phone until a couple hours later. And his reaction was, when he answered the phone was, what do you want, mom? <laughs> <laughs> it was five o'clock in the morning and he was tired. And so I said, uh, James, I won the Nobel Prize. And I can't repeat exactly what he said here, but he said, oh my goodness, that was just, he was so thrilled for me. And of course he jumped in the car, drove over to another house where my other son was sound asleep and woke him up. And then the two of them came to meet me at Caltech later that day. So when I finally got back to Caltech, because all the flights were full from Dallas to Los Angeles, so I made it back about, oh, 10 hours after the announcement. I, I made it back and uh, Caltech picked me up at the airport and brought me to campus and all my students were uh, spread out on the campus. They had made big posters. They were wearing their lab t-shirts and they gave me a standing ovation as I walked onto campus. It was really lovely. Uh, and then all my colleagues congregated in the chairman's office and toasted me with champagne. Yeah. I'm still working on that one. It's a fairly recent event and up till Today, winning the Nobel Prize has meant uh, a lot of work. <laughs> Putting together schedules and hearing from many friends and supporters, hearing from my old babysitters. I have heard from thousands of people all over the world, many of whom I've never met, who just want to say how happy they are for me. I've heard from many people I have met and have long forgotten, but I've heard from many people who I care about. Uh, so it seems to be a shared event. It's not just about me. It's about everyone you've ever touched in your whole life and people you haven't yet touched but now will as a result of this prize. My father was a physicist, experimentalist, and he loved fixing things and building things. He would allow us in the workshop every once in a while. I had four brothers, so we were always competing. Who would be better in math? Who would be better at building things? I, I, um, I always had a flair for competition. <laughs> Well, for one thing, as I was growing up, I was shaped by the fact that I had all these brothers, some older, one is older, three were younger. So I learned how to hold my own with the bigger boy, but also how to boss everybody else around. <laughs> so I ended up organizing the brothers a lot, but we're also very close. Uh, in fact, three of my brothers are here with me in Stockholm. And uh, we, we had friendly competitions for many things. No, there wasn't. Uh, uh, of course, as I was growing up, being a scientist was not 
on my list of things to do. I enjoyed science. I wanted to be a scientist when I was a kid. I didn't worry about too much what I would do when I, would, I was going to grow up. But I tried lots of different things. I thought I would be a diplomat. Then I realized I had no diplomatic skills. I wanted to be a CEO of a multinational corporation. Then I realized that was a lot of work. <laughs> uh, and I studied engineering because it was the easiest option uh, and the easiest way to get into Princeton University at that time. And I never left. I love solving problems. Uh, I think science and engineering is a fabulous career for people who see problems in the world that need solutions. My talent happens to be in coming up with technological solutions to those problems. <clears throat> but there are plenty of problems for which we will need solutions. So I think that's a, a, a lovely way to use your skills and creativity in, in, in identifying problems and then finding clever new ways to solve them. The traits that are important to be successful in science include an ability to accept criticism. There's plenty of it to go around. <laughs> uh, and to benefit from criticism. If someone takes enough time to criticize your work in a constructive way, and you are able to listen to that, of course, you know, you have to set aside the feelings of hurt feelings, say, perhaps the, what I, I need to listen to what's going on. Why is this idea not coming across? What is the fault I have in the way I communicate the idea? Or maybe the idea really is lousy. <laughs> but we have to be able to uh, join the discussion. As a scientist and, and engineer, independence, of course, is extremely important. You have to come up with your own solutions to problems. You have to come up with your own questions if you're going to be a scientist and really explore something new. On the other hand, teamwork is important. So this wonderful balance of independent creativity, but then convincing all these dozens of students to take on some of these problems and, and put their own ideas into it is, uh, is, this, is the balance that we have to uh, master. I don't think it's necessary that scientists work on problems of societal impact. I, I, there's so many wonderful stories of how just curiosity has led to societal impact. And that if you start off saying, I'm going to solve climate change, huge problems, or figure out how to purify water, you may come up with a solution, or you may not. Uh, it may not be a particular person's passion. I think science is beautiful, and that those of us who have a passion to understand how the universe works, how communities work, how people work, how our minds work. Just to understand that will also contribute to eventually solving the problems. I particularly like working on problem solving. That comes from probably my personality, but also my engineering background. Engineering's all about how do you come up with a solution to a problem. But I should say that much of my work has deep science roots, where if we come up with a solution for a problem, what does that tell us about the underlying phenomena? What do we learn? And evolution is such a great way to do this. I use this process of evolution to create new biological things that no one would know how to design. They're too complicated. But once I have them and it solves a problem, 
I can go in and do the reverse engineering. I can understand or try to understand how they acquired the new traits that they have. And that way I can contribute to a f more fundamental understanding of how bio biology works and how evolution works. I have done a lot of thinking over the last few months about the scientists and philosophers and writers who've influenced my work for the last 40 years. Uh, I've been strongly influenced by Jorge Luis Borges, a writer, by the philosopher Dan Dennett, and by a whole slew of really creative scientists who, whose ideas I recombined in some new way. And uh, it's wonderful to go back and, and view those ideas and, and see in retrospect how they were reassembled. The diversity of background that I have, which runs the gamut from studying Russian literature to aerospace engineering and chemical engineering, and I speak a number of languages. I've been interested in many things over my lifetime. I didn't actually become a professor of chemical engineering until I was 30 years old. I was doing many other things before that, including being a taxi driver. Uh, all those experiences, even if they were not the most positive experiences, uh, made, my, made me who I am. And I think the diversity of experience is, uh, makes me very different from everybody else. I try not to give too much advice because specific advice doesn't help. Right? My path is different from your path. But don't be afraid of a path. Take it. <laughs> when you come to the fork in the road, take it. Do something. Right? Even if you don't know what it is and where it will lead you, do it. Do something. And do it as well as you can. If you don't like it, take another path. Life is not doors closing, it should be doors opening. I think it's neither too early nor too late to become a scientist or engineer. It may be hard to study that math, but you could do lots of interesting things just by being curious. I work in a remarkable institution, the California Institute of Technology. We have 900 undergraduates and 1,000 graduate students. It's really small. <laughs> and they come from all over the world just in love with science. And that's what they want to do. They want to do science. And they want to do it at the highest levels. So I am working with these tremendously talented and motivated people. Their ideas are phenomenal. They haven't been molded into some you know, hard set piece of clay. They're completely open. And their creativity is just waiting to be unleashed. So I get to spark that flame and watch that creativity just explode. How could you not like that? It's very much a privilege to work with them. They're nice people. They care about others. It's my job to provide them the resources to do science, the environment that lets them feel free to express this creativity, the support they need when it fails, as it inevitably does. Everybody goes through periods of, oh, nothing works. And then to give them the credit also, when everything works and they graduate and go on to form their careers, I have 250 children 
<laughs> as a result of this over the years, many of whom are coming to Stockholm. And the ones who aren't have all, you know, participated in some way in this event. It's all about the people. I'm one brain, and sometimes there's one brain that can do everything, but that's not my brain. But what I'm good at is encouraging 20 brains to work together. And when you have 20 really good brains, you can do a lot. So I like to, um, to bring those brains together. We enjoy each other. We're friends. And we uh, like to celebrate our successes. So I have a group of many of those people who've gone on to other careers who are coming back to celebrate this. I had several mentors as a younger scientist, uh, people whose work I admired, whose ideas I admired, and who encouraged me to go and try wonderful things. People who found me a job in Brazil in the 1970s, and people who supported my PhD aspirations. Uh, throughout my career, I've been lucky to have inspirational scientists. I think it's enjoyable to inspire the next generation of scientists. Uh, I, I, I try to avoid the moniker role model because there are many things I've done that I certainly would not want to model <laughs> for anyone. Uh, life is challenging and we all have to go through ups and downs. Uh, but I would love in any way if I can inspire people to keep going through the hard parts. Um, science is not easy. This is a hard job. And you have to be willing to take that criticism and you have to be willing to take those failures. Uh, but the joys far outweigh the difficulties in my mind. Well, I keep going because if I don't solve this problem, I'll go to the, another problem, right? I, I love problem solving, but I haven't chosen any one specific problem. I define my problems. And if you define your problems, maybe you can even come up with problems people didn't even know were problems. And then when you solve it, they realize that was, hey, that was a really interesting problem. <laughs> so that's, that's one way to get around the, the problem of failure. I think we're doing, we're starting to do that. What I'm finding is that it, in my field in chemistry, there are a lot of really bright, strong women doing chemistry, and they're doing great chemistry. Uh, it's a challenge, of course, to juggle everything. Of course, I think women are the best jugglers. <laughs> I don't know anybody who juggles more things than women do. But we also take on a lot to juggle. So these are the challenges, is to encourage women to take on yet more balls in the air and say, you can do this, and you can actually enjoy it as well. I'm sure there are many challenges that, that I've encountered. I have to say my personality is that I'm blissfully unaware. If someone doesn't like what I do, I've always been able to say, well, sorry, <laughs> that's who I am and that's what I like to do. Uh, I think that having the four brothers helped there. Um, so many of the challenges where people would look at my work and for example, disregard its importance or uh, say it's not science, <laughs> which is criticism I had early on, I could just say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I think the progress 
uh, of women taking on careers at universities in science and technology. The progress has been slow, but it has been somewhat steady. Uh, it, it's still not good enough. I don't see the 50% parity that I see at undergraduate level. For example, at Caltech, 50% of the undergraduates are women, but only 20% of the professors. To some extent, that's a time difference, and maybe in 10 years that will change, but I'm not sure that's the case. There's something systemic that is holding women back from wanting to do this job. I think if they want to do the job, they could do it and they could get the jobs. But for some reason, a number of them say early on, well, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> I don't want to work as hard as you do. I don't want to have all these responsibilities because I'd like to focus elsewhere. It's not easy to do everything. It is something that the system can help with, and, and many uh, improvements have been made. When I had a baby, 1990, my university had no maternity policy because no one had had a baby before. So that had to be developed. And now everybody has babies, but that was a new phenomenon. And we had to go through the process of how do we support women so that they can succeed and can have all the other things that everyone wants? My favorite advice for young women who want to do science and engineering is by all means do it. Even if you don't want to do it, don't leave it for the men because it's so much fun. It's fun, it's important, it's really thrilling to use your creativity to do useful things for people. Don't leave it for the men. I think everybody needs to know something about science and engineering. Maybe they don't go and get a degree in it, but we need a scientifically literate population. Science and technology, it's a future. It's the future of the planet. Without science and technology, we won't feed 10 billion people. We won't provide water. We won't have cities that are even worth living in. It's science and technology. So everybody has to do it. And most certainly women are going to play a huge role in the future of science and technology because that's where 50% of the best minds are. The wonderful thing about evolution is that here is a design process that works at all scales, from molecules to ecosystems. One design algorithm that solved everything in life, created everything in the living world. What I realized is that we're just at the beginning of using evolution to move into the future. So what that means is that these processes that we pioneered many years ago have started to be used by hundreds of people, thousands of people, to do very creative things with real applications. So for example, uh, pharmaceuticals are being manufactured using enzymes that have been optimized by directed evolution. That's important because they used to be made using toxic metals and processes that would generate tons, literally tons of waste products. Now they're made using a clean enzyme process. I am brought here uh, as one of my guests to Stockholm, a young man who started a company. He got his PhD in my lab doing directed evolution. And he recently started a company that's replacing pesticides with insect pheromones. Turns out if you spray a little bit of a insect pheromone in a field, you can confuse males. When you confuse the male insects, they don't mate. No caterpillars, the crop damage is not there. And it's a wonderful organic replacement for 
dumping pesticides onto the planet, all made by synthetic biology, by engineering biological systems to make chemicals that they don't normally make. And uh, these applications are thrilling to me because I see a sustainable future for the planet by using some of these design processes and designed molecules that nature invented. I started my career back in the 1970s working on solar energy when President Carter was our leader and the United States had a national goal of 20% renewable energy by the year 2000. It was a shame that that national goal, of course, went by the wayside when there was a change of administration. And I felt that my career path in solar energy might be somewhat limited, so I switched out of solar energy and went into biotechnology at the beginning of the DNA revolution. I stayed with renewable energy, though, looking at ways we could replace pumping oil out of the ground and using biological systems then. And I've stayed with that ever, that, that passion for replacing dirty chemical processes with clean biological processes for many years because I care deeply about our natural world and how we can maintain a beautiful natural world and all these interesting products of evolution, lions and tigers and rhinos and monkeys and even insects. <laughs> all these things are beautiful. They're beautiful products of evolution and we will be greatly uh, impoverished if we do not make space uh, for all these other things that we admire.